So we're going we're gonna to skip ahead right now to the presentation, How Hacking Helps Us, that had originally been scheduled at 3.50, just to get some more time for, uh, before Annie can come. So this, I think, will be, um, uh, this is something that is a subject of great, uh, dis a lot of debate. And uh, the word hacking has very different connotations, depending on uh, which crowd you are crowdsourcing. Um, we're fortunate today to have Tiffany Rad, a research scientist in the cybersecurity group at the Battelle Institute. Uh, she's going to give a presentation on this subject. Thank you, Tiffany. Hi, I'm here talking to you um, sort of with, with two hats that I'm going to be wearing today during my brief 15-minute uh, presentation. Um, I'm a research scientist at Patel. I work in their cybersecurity group, and I'm an embedded systems engineer doing some work with them on accessing car computers, and we're evaluating safety and security. Um, Battelle is an institute that not a lot of people know about, but it's a nonprofit based in Columbus, Ohio. I work out of their Columbia, Maryland office, and I actually am proud to say my office is going to be in a garage. That's the kind of work I do. I don't have a cubicle. I work in a garage. Uh, it's a 501c3 nonprofit, which means about uh, a large portion of yearly profits, about 20% of, um, of the net, goes toward putting money back into education and teaching students and the industry about the type of work that we do. Um, I'm also a founder of a hackerspace, and as, as was mentioned, uh, hacker carries a lot of connotations. Some of you may not have heard it from the, the term that I'm going to be using it, but uh, if you're here at this conference, you know what a maker, uh, makerspace is, hackerspace, kind of the same thing. I take things apart and I figure out how they work, and I work to design them better. Um, we, uh, we have about 250 members online at the hackerspace, and it's attached to a private high school, so the high school students have access to the equipment in the hackerspace during the day, and the uh, adults at the hackerspace come in to use it on nights and weekends. Uh, we have a 3D printing group, too, which seems to be one of the most popular ones we have. But I'm talking to you today about uh, accessing your car computer. And actually, the way I got my job at Patel was I, um, I'm the founder of a car hacking group at the Hackerspace. Uh, we got together, and we had about 40 people turn out, and uh, everyone from mechanics to, to people who tinker with their cars and the, with the car computer and, uh, and attorneys such as myself. Um, I'm, uh, I have a bachelor's in science, but I'm also an attorney and have an MBA, so I help get things up and companies up and going, looking at the intellectual property and the business aspects of their ideas. Um, a lot of cars right now, uh, if you take your car with a, a light on that says check engine, uh, if you take it to your local neighborhood mechanic, they can fix a lot of with the car. They can. One of the problems they have, though, is to be able to access the car computer to turn that idiot light off, the check engine light off, so your car can pass inspection after it's been fixed. They can't do that. They have to take, you have to take your car to a dealer, and you, they usually charge you about $100 just to plug your car into their proprietary computer to say, turn that check engine light off, it's been fixed. And a lot of the local mechanics said, hey, that's not really fair. We want to be able to do this. But now that cars have so many computers in them, this is making it a little bit more difficult. Uh, so hence some of the research projects uh, I've been doing. I've been accessing car computers for about 10 years. And now professionally with Battelle, this is one of the first times I've been able to do it uh, with another group of, a group of hackers. Um, and uh, when you need to get your car serviced, this becomes a problem. And we're trying to alleviate some of those problems. Your car knows a lot more about what is going on with the computer than it outputs to you. If you purchase a car, you shouldn't just have a, a license to the software that runs it. I mean, you want to be able to see what information it's storing about you for privacy purposes, things like that. Uh, so there's a lot that your car knows about you and your driving that it doesn't output. Um, and so some of the things I'll talk to you about just very briefly are what we are researching right now. Um, that are outputted through like a federally mandated emission control standards. And there's things that a basic scan tool can do. Um, so uh, your car may not look like this. Uh, maybe that's a good thing, actually. <laughs> but uh, there are a lot of small computers in your car, a whole lot of them. And if you have a performance car, whether it's a performance sedan or a sports car, it's even more. And an interesting fact is that um, the premium class automobiles run about 100 million lines of computer code, and that's more than Boeing's new aircraft. It's a lot of code. So what does that code, uh, what does it do with all these computers in your car? It would be kind of interesting to be able to do more if you knew that. 
that, maybe you could. And here's a little bit of a warning. Um, this is more from the legal side of things when you access your car's computer. Are you, uh, this is actually a, a picture from my backyard in, in Maine. <laughs> but what do you do when you're trying to access your car's computer? There's a layer of cryptography that if you break it, you're going to be triggering something called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, unless you use uh, legal reverse engineering techniques, getting to a lot of that code um, is very difficult to do. And what's the problem is, is when you're trying to research security or safety aspects of your car, you can't do that without breaking some of the cryptography unless you do the very expensive and time-consuming legal, legal reverse engineering. So um, the DMCA is one of, is, is really the, the, the piece of legislation that we, we are evaluating and we look at, like how does this affect people that own cars? What, how, you want to be able to access these things. Um, so um, now to kind of counter some of the uh, issues, I, I don't think the DMCA was initially enacted uh, with the intent that it would prevent people from uh, fixing and accessing their car computers. It's kind of just the way that it, uh, that piece of legislation has worked out. So we have the Right to Repair Act. Um, it says, it, one of the debates about this is that big automobile manufacturers don't really, they're not really happy with this act. They say if people can access their computers and their cars, they're going to be a lot of safety issues. And what some of the other side, the researchers are saying is, there may be some safety issues we'd like to discover before things go wrong, but because we can't access the car computers, it's very difficult to do. Um, so the Right to Repair Act, unfortunately, from the last time I've been able to see any reference of it, it's stalled in committee. But it is a, an important act. Um, one of the things that uh, the Right to Repair Act allows is that you should have a lot to be able to diagnose and service your own vehicle. Your local neighborhood mechanic will then be maybe a more of an even playing ground when it comes to the dealers. I mean, if you don't want to take your car to a dealer, you should have an option to take it to someone who's local. Um, it'll sell tools and equipment to accomplish the same types of things, like developing scan tools and things like that are, is very expensive, but it need not be. Uh, there are even Arduino projects right now where you can access a lot from your car computers. Um, but it, one of the things that is unfortunately is not defined in the act that I would have liked to have seen more about is uh, you are not, it just says that a mechanic can access these things. But am I a mechanic? Some states actually have a definition of what a mechanic is. You have to be licensed, attend different types of programs. I don't do that. I've just been accessing car computers for 10 years. So I would have liked to have seen more about uh, protecting um, individuals, really, really the do-it-yourself people who want to fix their own cars. So, accessing car computers for research and education. I'm also a computer science professor at the University of Southern Maine, and I teach my students um, about ethics, law, and information security. I teach them to think like hackers. And I'll tell you, in, um, in an accredited CS program, this is something that has taken a little bit of time, oh, sorry, a little bit of time to, uh, to, to be able to uh, get the faculty members used to it. But understanding how things work and how things are being broken by people with malicious intent, you'll be able to design things better. Um, this is the philosophy I have, so I don't just teach my students about, here's a history of different types of hacks that have occurred both on US government sites and on different types of technologies. But this is how they do it. And really, it's, uh, this type of knowledge isn't something that uh, I believe should be suppressed or um, it should be shared, especially in an academic environment, when you want to see how things are broken. So my students hopefully will design them better and make better choices than um, some have made when it comes to accessing uh, computers and devices. But what we're doing at uh, Battelle is we are teaching people from the industry, and I have a slide that'll show you um, how many, but we have 20 high school students, 20 college students, a group from federal agencies, like one from FBI, one from DHS, and uh, we have STEM educators as well. We have seven, five to seven cars, and we're going to have everyone accessing these car computers. And one of the purposes for this is that we're teaching people uh, about secure coding, rugged coding, programming, and secure hardware design. You can't tack on security and safety at the end. It needs to be designed from like the first line of code to the last. It is something that can be done. It's just a different way of thinking that we're trying to bring into academia, into the industry, and into the federal government. And that's why we chose people from each sector to attend our our Car Hacking Institute. It's actually called Domain 5 Con. It's one week at Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland, and we put all the students up in the barracks, and then we, we take them to an aircraft carrier where we have all our cars, and we teach them different kinds of things that they can access with the cars. 
Um, we're going to have about five, or five to seven American manufactured cars. And uh, we're going to have different types of competitions. It's to get the groups. I mean, and this group would be like a few from high school, a few from college, the government agents, and all working together on a particular goal. And that goal is uh, different types of competitions we're setting up, uh, such as reviewing uh, you know, how, how easy it is to reset the odometer, things like that, the speedometer. And this is really the breakdown of the type of people we'll have at this, um, this camp. And, and the reason I'm discussing this is because uh, I listened to the conversations that I was driving into DC, uh, the earlier presenters today. Um, STEM educators, uh, getting them to understand what we're doing in industry and how this will help academia as well. And um, so maybe some of these, these students coming up through the camp, both from the high school and college level, will want to do something similar, join hackerspaces, create new research, new products. But um, uh, one of the things we're doing is also understanding what legal reverse engineering is, what it isn't. Um, but uh, we have a 45-foot uh, trailer that we're going to be driving around the United States. And I, I personally am not going to be driving this trailer, but it's a race trailer with a car in the back. And the car in the back can be hacked. <laughs> and uh, the race trailer has this uh, sort of stage that folds out and an awning and chairs. And we'll have uh, teachers, STEM educators from that area doing demonstrations for the students and allowing the students actually hands-on access to this is how you write code, uh, this is what the protocols look like when they're coming out of the car computer. Um, and we are doing this. We were going to do it at tour camp, and actually that's changed in the past few days, unfortunately, just because of timing. We, we can't go to tour camp, but we're driving this around the U.S., and those of us uh, security researchers, Battelle, one or two of us, will we'll meet the trailer wherever it's going to go. But we're doing this for colleges, universities, high schools, um, and part of this is really the outreach to get students thinking this way and to get more people to sort of challenge the notion that if you buy a car or you buy a computer or whatever that device is, that you don't really, you can't really know what's going on with it, that you buy it and it's closed and locked up by intellectual property. We're encouraging open standards when it comes to safety and security for vehicles. And there's actually a group in the, um, in the EU called Evita. And what Evita is doing is they're, um, they're creating a more secure platform for vehicles. And and uh, they're doing that in an open platform. So those of us, other researchers, can be able to access it too. Because when it does come to the safety and security of the vehicles you drive, I, one of our philosophies is you really want to know how that car operates, what it's doing, and maybe you want to customize it as well. So that's kind of the, the do-it-yourself. We're encouraging that type of thought and that kind of research. So um, that's the end of my presentation, but uh, thank you very much.